second lecture on motor proteins, we will be looking at the nucleic acids based motor proteins. In the previous lecture, we looked at the cytoskeleton filaments like motor proteins, where we saw that the motility was based on a specific type of tract, whether it was the tubulins for the dynein, the, tubul the microtubule for the dynein's and the kinesins, or the actin-based filament for the myosins. In this lecture, we will be looking at nucleic acid motor proteins and an example of a rotary motor protein. The different types of proteins are the polymerase, the helicase, the gyrase, the ribosome, ATP synthase, and bacterial flagella. This is what we will cover in this lecture. When we look at nucleic acids motor proteins, the name implies that they are motor proteins that are involved in the presence or the utility or the movement of DNA and RNA. Now, when we look at nucleic acid motor proteins, we know that they vary in their structure, they vary in their function, and they vary in their mode of action or their mechanism. They have the ability to move DNA or RNA, or they could also move along DNA or RNA. So either they will be moving DNA or RNA or they themselves will move along DNA or RNA. So the nucleic acids motor proteins are of different types. They are polymerase, helicase, gyrase and ribosomes. We will be looking at each of these types and see what they can actually do and how they function. These motor proteins, the polymerases, the helicases, the topoisomerases, gyrases, so they function as their name implies or the type of motor proteins that they are. They function by associating with the nucleic acids. And this association, the DNA and the RNA association, we will be looking at the types of association and how they interact in our discussions of, of protein nucleic acid interactions in a later lecture. But to understand how the motor proteins work, we need or we understand that they have to associate themselves with the DNA and the RNA mo molecules. The source of chemical energy for the motor proteins is the polymerization reactions of the nucleic acids, the synthesis of the proteins, and or ATP hydrolysis. The polymerases, as the name implies, will be in the formation of or the polymerization of the specific nucleic acid that we are interested in. So if we look at DNA polymerases, they are multi-subunit enzymes that are involved in DNA replication. What they do is they catalyze the addition of nucleotides onto existing strands, which means that they increase the strands and they are a, it is a polymeric a polymerization activity. And the way it works, it usually works in pairs and it creates two identical daughter DNA strands from one original DNA molecule. So this is the function of the DNA polymerase and we realize its importance in DNA replication where we have two daughter strands built from one original DNA molecule. RNA polymerases are enzymes that are involved in the transcription process. This uses a single strand DNA template to synthesize a complementary strand of RNA. So we realize the very important activity of these specific proteins involved in the way they function and what they can do. If we look at the nucleic acids motor proteins, we have DNA polymerase, for example, in this case, and we have the nucleoside triphosphate. This is commonly referred to as NTP. So this is the nucleoside triphosphate. 
and the DNA polymerase synthesizes long chains of nucleic acid and moves along the DNA strand. So what happens here, here we have our nucleoside triphosphate that comes and sits at its associated site. So here we have A, that is the adenine base. Here we have thymine and we know that we have the A double bond T. So this is the connection with the hydrogen bonds between the two nitrogenous bases. So when we have this connection, so here we have our DNA stretch. The extension therefore occurs where we have now the hydrolysis of the ATP and then we have the extension occur due to the presence of the DNA polymerase protein. The structure of the DNA polymerase is such that it has subdomains. These subdomains are termed as the palm, the finger and the thumb. There are palm, there's a fingers and there is a thumb. The palm contains the catalytic sites. The fingers are responsible for the nucleotide recognition and binding. And the thumb is crucial for binding of the DNA substrate. We have learned how protein ligand binding, in this case protein nucleo, nucleic acid binding, is a method of molecular recognition in each of these cases. And in addition to this, there are two metal ions in the active site that stabilize the transition state, which we learned about in enzyme catalysis. So this nucleotide binding induces a significant conformational change that involves in an open to closed transition of the finger domain. So this is the palm, the beta sheet that is the catalytic site. The fingers are associated with the alpha helical conformation and so is the thumb. Then this is the exonuclease and the DNA polymerase works in a fashion that would form from our nucleotide triphosphate with N number with the addition of another nucleotide triphosphate go to N plus 1 in the process releasing the PPI and the enzyme that is bringing about this reaction is the DNA polymerase. This is where our template is. And the incoming N DNTP, that is the nucleoside triphosphate, and we would have the formation of the PPI, the removal of the PPI, and the extension. In the case of RNA polymerase, these RNA polymerases, they unwind DNA locally and they open the double-stranded DNA so that one strand of the exposed nucleotides can be used as a template for the synthesis of RNA that is required for the, in the process of the transcription. We all know we would have DNA to RNA to protein. So this RNA polymerase comes into the picture. It accomplishes the de novo synthesis. It moves rapidly across the DNA template to transcribe the DNA. And this is powered by the generated free energy from the nucleotide polymerization and RNA folding reactions. So we have our specific structure. This is our RNA polymerase. And this is where the incoming NTPs come into the picture. So we have our nucleotide monophosphate, the nucleotide triphosphate, and this is where we would have the formation of the specific set of DNA. So the polymerization that occurs here, where we would have the template created, like we saw in what the role of the RNA polymerase is, so we have a region here where we are going to have the transcription process, the transcribing that is going to occur for the DNA, which we just saw in the previous slide here, where we have the movement along the DNA template to transcribe the DNA, and we would have this process. So the RNA polymerase, we would have the incoming NTP, the RNA itself, the rewinding of the DNA that would occur, after 
the template was created. So there would be a region that would have RNA and DNA known as the hybrid region. In the next set of examples of motor proteins, we have the helicase. The helicase proteins utilize the energy derived from ATP hydrolysis and they move along the nucleic acid to separate the two nucleic acid strands. So again, this superfamily, it is called F SF3 and SF6, belong to the triple A plus family of ATPases that we discussed in the previous lecture. This plays a crucial role in DNA replication, transcription, translation, recombination, DNA repair, and ribosome biogenesis. So we understand the importance of this specific protein in the process of DNA replication, transcription, translation, recombination. So this is where we have a separation of the two nucleic acid strands of the DNA. So this is where helicase comes into the picture. So this is where we have the two strands being separated. This moves in a unidirectional way on the nucleic acid phosphodiester backbone and it unwinds DNA and RNA using energy from ATP hydrolysis. So the helicase is moving in a specific direction where we have what is called a leading strand and a lagging strand. A discussion of that is beyond the scope of this course. But what we do understand is there is a movement of the helicase in a unidirectional manner. And as it does that, it this unidirectional way on the nucleic acid phosphodiester backbone and it unwinds the DNA. So this is where it unwinds the DNA as it goes along. There is another protein called the topoisomerases and what the topoisomerases does, it relieves the strain that is caused by the unwinding of the DNA. So helicase results in the unwinding of the DNA and the topoisomerases helps to relax the coil as it is getting unwound by the helicase molecule. The topoisomerase, therefore, is an enzyme that cuts the either one strand of DNA or both the strands of DNA. There are several types. The topoisomerase type 1, for example, cuts only one strand. And the topoisomerase 2 cuts both these strands. An example of one such topoisomerase is gyrase. So DNA gyrase belongs to the class of topoisomerases. Here, as we looked at in the previous slide, it catalyzes in the DNA supercoiling relaxation and it introduces negative supercoils into the DNA, again at the expense of ATP hydrolysis. The structure of the sequences of the gyrase molecules, gyrase proteins, present in the prokaryotes are different than those in the eukaryotes because they have different affinities for different molecules, gyrase are oftentimes used as good targets for antibiotics. So this is a molecule that catalyzes DNA supercoiling relaxation and it belongs to the class of topoisomerases. And because it has different affinities for different molecules, it is often a very good target for the development of antibiotics. So this is our gyrase molecule and this is its mode of action and what it does is its main job like the topoisomerase is because it is one such topoisomerase, it re reduces the topological strain of the DNA duplex using the hydrolysis of ATP to release the strain due to the unwinding of the fragments, unwinding of the double helix. This unwinding is brought about by helicase. In the ribosome now, the important, very important protein, there is the development of the growing peptide chain. So we have the ribosome protein that is the whole machinery for the formation of the peptide chain and we have the mRNA template. Now, in the process, which we will visit in a later class as well, we will be looking at 
these specific types of proteins in the rotary motor protein that is another type of protein. So we have the nucleic acids type protein. In the nucleic acids type protein, we looked at the different polymerases, the helicase, the gyrase, and the topoisomerase. And the ribosome, which we will visit later, in looking at protein nucleic acid interactions. The rotary motor proteins, an extremely important one, is ATP synthase. As in all the, the discussion that we have based on motor proteins, ATP hydrolysis is what is driving the reaction or the enzymatic function to occur. So the ATP synthase is one very important molecule that uses a specific process to generate ATP. The rotary motor proteins also contain bacterial flagella that are used for their movement. And the there is rotation of one subunit of these specific molecules with respect to the other ones. The ATP synthase is the formation of ATP. We were looking at ATP hydrolysis. ATP synthesis is, of course, one of the most important reactions that would occur. And this occurs in the mitochondrial matrix where there is a positive side and there is a negative side. We will be looking at this when we study membranes and membrane proteins as well and looking at the membrane potential, the transport across the membrane. In this case, we have the proton transport. So P indicates a positive side of the mitochondrial matrix and N indicates a negative side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So energetically unfavorable ATP synthesis is driven by this flux of protons across a membrane by what is called a proton gradient that we will visit when we study membrane transport in more detail. What we are now concerned with is the rotary motor movement of the specific protein that results in the synthesis of ATP. This is ATP synthase and in respiration what happens there is a proton gradient across the plasma membrane in bacteria or mitochondrial membranes that is used to build ATP via ATP synthase. What happens is there is proton flow through a subunit of this specific protein called the F0. We will see what this means in a moment. If we look at the protein, there are three types, A, V, F, ATPases. They are composed with membrane-bound sectors that contain an ion channel because we know there has to be the flux of protons and specific catalytic sites. And there are rotary motors that are connected to a gamma shaft. If we look at the structure, we will see what it means. The counterclockwise rotation of this particular shaft for ATP hydrolysis and the clockwise rotation occurs of the gamma shaft for ATP synthesis. So there is a shaft movement due to the rotary motors and if there is a clockwise rotation, there is synthesis. If there is a counterclockwise motion, there is hydrolysis. It is a wonderful molecular machine. So we have in this protein an F0 and F1 domain. This is F0, F1 ATP synthase. There is a catalytic domain that is comprised of three alpha and three beta subunits. And this is where we have our membrane channel where we will have the proton flux movement. So we have the catalytic core, which has three alpha, three beta, one gamma, one delta, and one epsilon unit. And the alpha and beta are arranged alternatively to form this specific hexameric sector of ring of the F1 subunit. And the delta acts as this connector. So this is the connector that is connecting your F0 and the F1. The ATP synthase types, they are composed of the F0 and F1 rotary motors. They are connected through the gamma shaft. So this is the gamma shaft and there is a counterclockwise 
movement or a clockwise movement depending upon whether they're going to be ATP hydrolysis or what. Now, the F0 and F1 are coupled back to back and they rotate in opposite directions. So, what happens is there is the cytosolic medium and there is the exoplasmic medium and this is the inner membrane. This remains static and this is where there is rotation. So, this is where we have a proton flux and this rotation is going to bring us the formation of ATP. So, there is going to be the proton flux. Then, once we have the movement of this proton, as it moves, we will have the ADP plus PI to ATP synthesis. Now, this is important because there are three beta subunits of the F1 that actually exists in three states. There is an O state, kind of an open state, that does not bind any molecule. So this is an O state that has no molecule bound to it. The T state binds ATP. So we see the adenosine and there are three phosphates associated here. So it binds ATP. L, that's this state, binds this. So there is an open state, kind of a tight state and a loose state. Now, what happens is there is the rotation of the gamma subunit. As this rotates, there is conformational change that is induced in this beta subunit as a result of which it shifts between the three states. So, at one state, O state, there is nothing bound to it. At one state, there is ATP bound and at the other state, there is ADP and PI bound. So, based on this rotation, there will be the synthesis or the breakup. So, we have here, so here is our B subunit and which is, which is either the open state, the tight state or the loose state and we have the gamma shaft. Now, the rotation of this gamma shaft can lead to hydrolysis or synthesis and this is very important for the rotation of the beta subunit in F1 in bringing about the specific synthesis or hydrolysis of ATP. And the interesting thing is that there is a maximum rotary speed during ATP hydrolysis even of 130 hertz of this specific machine. The other rotary protein that is important is the bacteria flagella. It is a hair-like structure. It acts as an organelle of locomotion in several cells. And here also there is a very high rotation for the E. coli. The flagella are at the base. It has a reversible motor. And the movement of the cell is in response to stimuli in the single direction due to the counterclockwise of the flagella rotation. This movement of the cell in response to the stimuli occurs due to clockwise rotation. So, there is some movement that occurs due to the counterclockwise and some movement, this is called the run and this is called the tumble. So, we have these two types of motion. If we look at the structural aspects of it, there is the cytoplasmic and there is the, again, the outer membrane and the cytoplasmic membrane and there is a specific hook of attachment and there are rings and there is this motor that actually has the movement of the flagella. The important thing of this, the movement of this will then of course call the flagella, cause the flagella to move. The flagella structure has in this case for gram negative flagella have, has four rings in the basal body. There is specific movement and there is a motor A and motor B complex that is a load sensitive proton channel. What happens here, it couples proton translocation with a torque generation. And this torque generation results in the, is due to the protonation and deprotonation of aspartic 33 in the motor B. And this induces the conformational change. So the proton translocation or the proton movement in this case results in a torque generation that results in the movement. The gram-positive flagella, on the other hand, has two rings in the basal body where there is a specific peptidoglycan layer in the gram-positive bacteria, but the method of motion or its mechanism of motion is similar to that of the 
gram negative ones. In summary, we have looked at the important biochemical and biophysical processes in this case that include cellular transport, cell division, and cell motility. And we see the importance of the motor proteins in bringing about these specific processes, even gene replication, transcription, and translation. So when we looked at cellular transport, we looked at a specific type of protein the cytoplasmic types of motor proteins that use the actin filament or the microtubules for their motion, for their cargo transport. In this lecture, we looked at nucleic acids and their motor proteins that in, are involved in DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So these cellular functions, all these cellular functions that are extremely important for the life processes are possible due to these classes of molecules that are called the motor proteins. There is still a lot of research going on in these motor proteins to understand them further. And there are several sites, several links, several books that are available that can provide you with more information based on the mechanism and workings of the motor proteins. These are the references. Thank you.